Like Julia just said, I'm Gavin Bate. I edit Utility Dive. We're a power sector trade publication based here near McPherson Square. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to our discussion about utilities and distributed resources. We've got a fantastic lineup here. Uh, right to my left is Arlen Ork uh, Orkard. He's the CEO and general manager of the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, or SMUD, as it's affectionately known, one of the largest munis in the country. Uh, next to him, we've got Luis Reyes. He's the CEO and general manager of the Kit Carson Electric Cooperative. And next to him, we've got Carlos Newell, who's the VP of New Energy Solutions at National Grid. And next to him, we've got Jill Anderson. Um, she is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of NYPA, the New York Power Authority. Um, before we get into our in-depth discussion of the utility's role in distributed resources, I wanted to kind of take everyone's temperature on the subject with a question that we asked um, actually in our State of the Electric Utility Survey. Um, so if we can throw up question number 11. Um, so I'll read this if anyone has a problem seeing it, but this is exactly how we phrased it to uh, a group of over 600 utility respondents, people from the youth sector. So should utilities be permitted to own and operate DERs? Yes, they should be able to own, and here's the thing, and rate base DER investments in all or most circumstances. That's answer A. Yes, but num question answer B is yes, but only when they provide uh, a service that the private market has failed to provide. C is yes, but only through unregulated subsidiaries, so no rate basing. Or just no, utilities should stay out of this sector. Um, so I won't, I won't divulge the results of our, uh, of our survey if you haven't seen it, because I don't want to sway your vote. Um, but if everyone could uh, you know, get on your little clicker there and uh, kind of respond to this question, I think it'd be great. Um, while you do that, I think we can uh, turn to these guys and have them kind of dive into our discussion about distributed energy resources. Um, I wanted us to just start by asking, you know, Arlen, why DERs for SMUD and why now? Okay, I feel like I should grab that and quickly vote for utilities <laughs> given the room, but I'll refrain from doing that. <laughs> so I have a staff person out there, so you know how to vote. Um, <laughs> So I'll give um, Smud's perspective on this. We're a community-owned utility, so we really think about um, in everything we do, how do we create value for our customers and community? And I'm pretty technology agnostic about how we do that. I'm looking for certain outcomes, and if a technology fix, fits that outcome um, in that value creation, I'm going to be open to in, investing in it, um, either on behalf of our customers or in some sort of a shared um, ownership strategy with our customers or in partnership um, with a third-party solutions provider. So we're open to all of that. It's really about what outcome are we trying to achieve. When um, it comes to um, DERs, um, we have, uh, in 2016, we rolled out a comprehensive enterprise-wide strategic plan that was really focused on continuing to meet that value proposition for our customers, but taking very clearly taking into account the um, pretty dynamic changes that are happening in our industry and in the te technology landscape and really focusing on helping us transition to a new business plan by 2020. And um, DERs play prominently in that plan, and so from that we developed a comprehensive, not you tear off these things, not surprising, uh, five-year strategy around DERs. And um, I touch on a few of those, and while I'm gonna put them in kind of the normal baskets you would expect me to, um, we're really trying to take an integrated approach when we think about DERs and look at bundling. So um, I'll use PV as an example, as the first example. Um, a lot of PV, as many of you know, uh, customer-owned PV in, in California. Sacramento is no different. By 2020, we expect to have um, around 400 megawatts of customer-owned uh, uh, solar. That obviously has operational, potentially operational implications for us, but it also has some um, revenue implications. So we're looking at what do we do around that. Um, certainly, we want to f facilitate our customer's choice, but we also want to have a play in that game, so we're going big into community solar. We expect to have more than 100 megawatts of our solar shares program um, available by the end of the year. Um, we're looking at what control technologies we're going to need to install in order to provide the visibility um, uh, that we need in order to manage, especially on those circuits that are high penetration circuits. 
When you look at electric vehicles, um, electric transportation, we're very supportive of that. We've been in support of that industry since the 1990s. I think we were at the forefront of utilities um, playing in the electric vehicle space. Um, it has some obvious benefits. Um, obviously, there's carbon reduction benefits that are very important to us, and we have specific metrics that we achieve on that. But also, it's a, it's a way to grow load, quite frankly, and so it's a revenue enhancement. Um, we're directly investing in the technology to uh, remove the um, barriers to um, electric transportation. So we're investing in um, uh, fast charging stations, DC fast charging stations, um, workplace charging, fleet electrification, and um, uh, residential incentive programs. We're um, doing some work on, also doing some work on managed charging, and we're partnering with a school district to um, do some work on elect, uh, electrifying their bus fleet. So we see this as a big opportunity. Um, it's also going to have a, a big opportunity as we get more and more renewables on the system to help manage some of the problems we're already seeing in California with the deep penetration of both utility and rooftops um, solar. Demand response, um, there's a challenge in California with demand response, and that's that the market price doesn't really support a robust DR market at this point. But the fact is, in California, the need to integrate renewables and decarbonize the system means we're going to need some very flexible carbon-free resources in the future. So we're investing in some um, technology platforms to be able to do that and to start to develop programs so that we can ramp rapidly when that market um, comes to bear. Um, storage is another one. Um, obviously, the barrier to that right now is the price of st storage is still pretty high, but it's coming down fast. We did a bunch of modeling in 2014, and just in three years, um, it's 24 percent lower than we predicted it was going to be, and our current modeling shows it's going to be at grid parity by 2023, 2024, which to me says that's probably 2021, 2022, because we're always a little wrong on that. Um, and so we're really focusing on where's our play going to be on storage. There's a lot of great work being done by third parties and utilities on the, on the grid side, the transmission and distribution side. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time internally um, working on that because I think there's going to be some learnings that we can leverage. Um, but we're going to be really focused on um, where's the customer's play in storage and where can we partner with customers, customers and third-party providers to um, focus on where that, those value stacks are and how can we um, take advantage of some of those value stacks and create opportunities that can be shared across the um, way. So we see a big part of our future uh, being DERs. We think um, kind of decentralization is here to stay. It's obviously changing the way we think about investments. So I think I'll stop there. Excellent. Well, certainly a lot going on out in Sacramento. Um, let's just keep going down the line. Uh, Luis, what, what's going on in your service territory? How are you guys uh, embracing the DER movement? So Kit Carson is a rural electric co-op uh, in north central New Mexico. We have about uh, 30,000 members. Uh, and, and we've really transformed about 17 years ago. Most co-ops have all requirement contracts with a G&T, uh, a generation transmission co-op. Uh, in 2016, Kit Carson broke away from that mm -hmm. uh, so that we could have more flexibility both from pricing and also to uh, put more renewables on our system. Uh, at, at the co-ops, we're driven by our members. So uh, in a poll of our members, we asked them what kind of power supply did you want, uh, how important was pricing, reliability, all the kind of the questions we've seen today. And they wanted us to be a, a renewable co-op. And so uh, we, we uh, partnered with a uh, third party, a broker, who buys our power. Uh, after six months, we renegotiated the contract. And so by 2022, Kit Carson's goal is to be 100% daytime solar uh, for our entire system. Uh, and tied to that, in 20, 2018, we'll start bringing on storage at utility scale uh, so that we actually will create about 60% of all our energy by 2022 should come from local resources. Uh, it's going to be done by building, and our, summer, our, our summertime peak, we are in the, in the mountains. We're at the uh, kind of the end of the Rockies. Mm -hmm. So we have no air conditioning. Uh, so our, our summertime peak is about 40 megawatts. So we're going we're gonna to build 41 megawatt arrays around our territory. And that goes 
really to the co-op uh, spirit of everyone in our territory is not going to be left out. Uh, because in today's environments, it's basically the have and the have-nots. If you have the money, you can put it behind the meter. If you don't, you don't. But you may want to participate in that program. Uh, so we, we've had to change the business model because uh, when we were with the GNT, they did everything for us. All we did is we took the power and paid the power bill. Uh, now we have to, uh, uh, through a broker, find the power, uh, get the power from Four Corners to, to Taos, 200 miles. Then you have to distribute the power. And then you have to deal with the issues we have back home of behind the meter and, and those complications. So I agree that uh, for at least Kit Carson, DG really is going to be our future. And some of the things we're looking at is how can we leverage batteries or storage to offset our transmission cost. Uh, uh, we also believe in that it's inclusive. Everyone will get solar energy regardless of what, what your background is. Uh, so we're partnering with uh, uh, municipalities, we're partnering with schools, with universities, uh, tribes. Uh, we currently will have a megawatt at uh, one of the two tribes we serve, which will make that tribe 100% uh, solar. So it gives then that tribe uh, the ability to market uh, outside of just gaming, you know, outside of just casinos, uh, a revenue stream to market uh, its, its tribe. Uh, so it really has, our, our business model dramatically has changed from someone else doing all the work for us to now we have to really keep uh, uh, the eye on, on the ball. And I think that's important because at a co-op, uh, people who run the co-op outside of the staff they're elected from the membership. So our board is, is, is theoretically a lot of lay people, farmers, ranchers, uh, business people who may know very little about the industry. And I think that's, that's kind of the, uh, the uniqueness of the co-op. It's, it's of the members uh, doing what the members want. Uh, the other thing that, that's occurred, and, and most of you know, is the timing is right because uh, price is now competitive. Uh, it's reliable. And again, with storage, and I agree, uh, we think that the prices are going to become uh, very affordable in the 2021 time period. But we think with us offsetting transmission cost, they may even be affordable today, given on our transmission tariffs we have uh, filed with FERC. Uh, so so that's, our, uh, that's our goal. Uh, it's completely, our business model is completely different than when I started in the business, where now we really, as co-ops, really have to do the work. Mm -hmm. and, and Luis, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't, if I remember back to when you guys split off from your GNT, it's not as simple as just saying, you know, okay guys, see you later. There was kind of a, you know, there, it, it was a difficult process that almost went to court and, you know, you guys had to, it was an effort to kind of respond to these customer preferences, was it not? Yes, so, so under the co-op model, uh, long-term contracts with GNTs are generally 40 and 50 years. So our contract with our, our, our power supplier then was till 2040. And we have a 5% cap. So at any time within that 2040 time frame, once we hit 5% of renewable energy, that was it for us. And so we could not build any more, especially with uh, energy usage diminishing. And that just wasn't acceptable. So it, it actually took about three and a half years of uh, PRC case, uh, really just a lot of uh, going back and forth, very contentious to exit our contract. So we had, to, we had to basically pay out our contract, which extended to 2040. We negotiated a, a payment, an exit fee, uh, uh, to leave the GNT, which really has GNTs concerned, because now it has given us the flexibility. Today I have a 10-year contract. After six years, we can uh, go into the marketplace and see what the cost price of power is. Uh, there's some risks there, but uh, uh, today with the GNT, the price curve was continually going up. There was no relief uh, for the distribution co-op. Uh, it gives us the ability to put as much renewable as our members want. And so instead of 5%, uh, you know, when you look at our load curve, about 60% will be from renewable resources. Uh, and we had the ability to fix the price. So we know what the price is gonna be now, and I know what the price is gonna be in 2026. That's a very powerful tool to give to the business community or to members that we know what the price of power is going to be. Uh, uh, when we negotiated our, our first set of purchase power agreements uh, with a third party, so we're, we have PPAs, we're not owning the solar assets, 
uh, we're getting, we're, we're going out 30 years, fixing the price for 30 years. And, and so uh, it's about a nickel. And so uh, at a megawatt. So yeah, you can get it cheaper if you build a 10 or 20 megawatt deal. But for us and the co-op uh, spirit, in, in 30 years, it'll still be a nickel. And so we've challenged our members to tell us what, e what other energy source you think is going to be basically lower than it is today. Uh, but it, it, it was very contentious. It's a model that GNTs don't like to see because if Kit Carson is successful, there's no reason that other co-ops can't start to do the same thing and address their member issues when it comes mm -hmm. to uh, uh, diverse, uh, you know, diversifying your portfolio of power. Yeah, I just wanted to spotlight that because when I first heard about the 5% cap, I believe it was at Tri-State, um, I it kind of boggled my mind that that still existed, um, but it does for, you know, for, for people who are still their members. Um, so maybe we can come back to that in, in a little bit, but thank you for elaborating there. Uh, Carlos, let, let's go to you. Um, I know National Grid's real active. You guys are, you know, have some service areas and jurisdictions that are really trying to push this issue. So, uh, you know, kind of give us the, the little download from you guys. Yeah, so it's hard to actually go after those two guys that pretty much cover everything else. So <laughs> I think poor GL probably would have a lot to say. Uh, but yeah, I mean, National Grid operates in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New York. Uh, obviously, three states where uh, they have pretty aggressive goals in terms of um, uh, carbon emissions as well as penetration of renewables. And, and just to put it out in perspective, um, for us, the gas business um, used to be a big driver for activity and work within the company. Um, over the last two years, uh, we've had more DG interconnections than new gas connections, right? So it actually shows how the business is starting to shift from a more traditional business of just connecting customers to serve them with a core commodity that you have to a business where you need to start bringing resources into the mix. And what that means for us is there's a lot of things that need to change, right? And I'll put it into two main buckets. Um, the first one is around the technology operation component. Um, and it's how do we actually maximize and ensure that all those distributed resources that are coming into the grid are being used and are being maximized and are being operated in the most effective way. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples and things that we're actually working on. Um, the first one is around hosting capacity, right? So one of the things we hear from a lot of developers is I want to make sure that the process of interconnecting my system, it works as quickly as possible and seamless as possible. So we're now starting to put information out there where developers can actually see what are some of those areas where they can actually start deploying their assets without having to make any upgrades to the system, which is a huge thing for them, right? Uh, granted, we're not where we want to be, so part of the reason why we're making additional investments in the system to have more visibility into how the grid operates is so we can actually give more granular data to those developers and say, not only you can put it in this overall substation, but you can put it in this feeder, and you can put this much, and we're, go we're going to explore ways that we can maximize the amount of DG that we can accommodate within a feeder. So that's one, one, one of the things we're doing. I think the second piece, which is also interesting around the kind of technology component, and, and it kind of ties to some of the questions and comments on the innovation panel, um, on non wireless alternative in New York, we are actually required that every capital project above a million dollar has to go through a non wireless alternative competitive solution. And, and for us, I mean, while it's something new and, and in all honesty, it is something that as a utility we're still getting used to it, it is an opportunity to start setting an opportunity for the, market play, the marketplace to really come forward and say, you know what, you have this capacity load, you have a megawatt here, you have a picking issue, whatever the issue is, here's the solution that we can bring to the table. So National Grid and all the utilities in New York are going to be doing RFPs. Uh, granted, I know the RFP is not the right way to do it. But if you think about the RFP, it's pretty <laughs> open because it is, uh, it's just defining what the problem is and what the, um, what the uh, demographics in that area are. So we're not saying it has to be a battery. We're not saying it has to be solar. We're saying, here's the issue. Go at it. Try to give us a solution. So those are two things we're doing more on the technology side. I would say on the business side, right, it's obviously we're the couple, so I mean the commodity issue, it's not as a big of an issue of an integrated utility, but there's obviously a lot of complications when you think about net metering and all those different factors that come into play. Um, one of the projects that we're working on in the Buffalo area is we're, we're looking to demonstrate this concept about uh, distributed system platform, which essentially what it is is, I mean, how do we start to replicate what the ISO does today at the transmission level, how do we do it at the distribution uh, level? And how do we start to think about that value stock for distribution um, um, 
distributed resources, and then how do we value them, not only for the commodity that they bring, but how do we actually value them uh, at different times on the distribution system because the value that they bring, but also for the environmental factors. So our model will consider all those different things and we'll start to have pricing signals at different times and different points in the systems. So customers that want to invest in DRs, they could say, look, uh, for us, it's actually cheaper to produce locally and rather than buying from the bulk system, we can actually get it from the local system. So uh, it is a fairly sophisticated platform but it is for us an opportunity to really start to think about how do we bring those distributed resources and make the most out of it for us as a broader system, but also for those customers that own them today, right? Uh, those customers are investing in them in some cases just because of a resiliency, just because they want to green, be green from a branding perspective. <clears throat> but now they have an, an initial value opportunity that they can maximize uh, by bringing those resources into the grid. So. I'll keep it short and sweet, and I'll turn it to Jill so she can say something. Hopefully Excellent. something new. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> so the New York Power Authority, we're a generation and transmission company, and we also are an energy services company. So we're the ESCO component for about 20% of New York State. We serve public entities. We serve New York City, like the airports and the trains and the schools, and we serve businesses around the state. So we've got a diverse set of customers just like everyone else up here. And so for us, DERs has really been driven from that customer demand. And it's, um, it's forced us, I would say, to reevaluate the relationship that we've had with our customer and how we talk to our customer and how we interact with them and how we judge how much value we're bringing them. And, and I'll give some specific examples you know, of what, what we typically do when we talk to a customer is we're thinking about uh, you know, what's their bill? What kind of long-term price stability can we provide? You know, of course, reliability we, we believe is, is of a concern for every customer. And that's been the conversation that we've had with customers for decades. But now that we're talking to them about distributed energy resources and sometimes about decisions they want to make that don't make rational economic sense, but that's what they want to do, it's forced us instead to talk about what is the customer's value you know, to their customers. What kind of business is our customer in, whether they're educating people because they're in edu you know, students in schools or they're in transportation and their business is moving people. And we've stopped talking to them about megawatt hours and dollars per kilowatt and started talking to them more about what are the outcomes they want to provide to the services that, that they're doing for their constituents. And, and that's really colored the conversations and the types of projects that we've been developing around DERs. Uh, you know, one example is we have a program throughout New York State we call K-Solar for schools. So it's like K through 12, it's K-Solar. <laughs> uh, and so and it's been hugely successful. Over 50% of the school districts in the state have registered to get an evaluation of putting solar on their rooftops or at their, on their property. And when we go in and we do a pro project with them, you know, the payback periods can be long because there are parts of the state that still have very low power price alternatives. So we're talking about 15 or 18 year payback periods. But they want to talk about how can we help them with getting solar into their curriculum? Can we provide engineers to come in and talk to their eighth grade science classrooms? And okay, we'll sign an 18 year payback contract, which you would think, <laughs> okay, this is never going to work at 18 years. But that's really started to make a transformation for us throughout our business about just that how we are talking to our customer, and it's going to affect how we do electric vehicle infrastructure deployment, how we're talking to them about storage. You know, we've got to get away from assuming all they care about is, you know, the meter spinning and the dollars in the bill and think more about, you know, they care about the temperature in the, the buildings that they're operating. You know, they care about how bright the lights are. They care about all of those things. Energy is what we care about, and it's we've got to stop expecting our customers to care about it. And, and we're seeing DER is really forcing us in that direction. Fantastic. Um, well, I really want to get into the more of the business implications and strategies behind these. But first, let's take a look at our poll results for question number 11. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Wow. So we even here at the I think so. I wouldn't have expected. Thanks for the vote, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so Can yeah. Can keep this slide, please? Fifty-five <laughs> percent, yes. Regulated utilities should be able to own and rate-based rate DER investments. 
That's an interesting finding. I'll tell you in our State of Electric Utility survey, we got over 600 respondents from all around the nation, everyone who self-reported as working for an electric utility, and option A got 71%. Yeah. And there was actually only 5% of people who chose option D, which was no ownership of utility, utility ownership of DERs. So within the sector itself, you could say that there is a strong majority of people, um, or at least within the regulated utility themselves. A strong majority of people want to be able to rate base this and I feel like you know just from our reporting we see a lot a growing number of utilities who say well that's a that's an energy asset this is an energy asset like the the meter is the only thing that separates them why shouldn't I be able to do this um, so I would love to kind of get into the nitty-gritty of some of these uh, projects that you guys talked about and how how you're financing them how you're working with third-party people um, you know Jill you went last the first I time, so first? yeah, no, can you, you tell us a little bit, like, how, are you, how does I, this case solar thing work? You know, are sure. you working with third party providers? Do yeah. you own it? Do they own it? Uh, that and any other projects? And so for us, there's definitely no one size fits all. And I actually would have voted for C personally, so I'll just admit it that, that I didn't vote That is the New York model, right? Uh, because yeah. it's, that's written it, out of you know, the PSC. I think that's, it that's, is, that's, and it, it, yeah, you know, it just is. in case anyone's listening, right? Yeah, so I have right. to say, but it, you know, to me, it should be the the best business model that results in the lowest cost to the customer for achieving the objectives that that they're interested in. And that's not always going to be rate basing it. Sometimes it has to be that it can stand on its own. Uh, so in the K-Solar example, we are a middleman, but the contract is between a third-party developer and the school directly for that long-term power purchase agreement because an entity like NIPA and the school can't monetize any of the tax benefits. So you want to go with a model that way because we're trying to get to the lowest cost possible. And there are others where if it's a you know, newer technology, we've put you know, smart inverters with storage and solar together in a package, and there NIPA has made some of the direct investment. Um, because mm -hmm. there wasn't a, a model that I, that I could necessarily um, as easily replicate like you can do at this point now, solar on a rooftop is pretty standard. Uh, so we're, we're looking at, at different models. In some cases, our customers want to own the asset. Uh, maybe they're making an investment, you know, like, like others have said, for their own uh, objectives of corporate um, objectives that they've put out, or maybe they've gotten some grant money, or, or it's, uh, you know, um, an opportunity through a manufacturer. You know, street lighting is interesting. It's not DER, you would say, traditionally, but we're doing a lot of LED street lighting upgrades, and we're doing some now where you're putting smart sensors in lighting. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would argue that maybe this is starting to be DER because you could remotely control dial up or down or you know, manage the load of the street light in a much more dynamic way than today. And there we're seeing towns and municipalities around our service territory buying the lights, the infrastructures from the utilities, now owning the lights and the asset themselves and, and making that investment. And there NIPA helps them by providing the financing, but we're talking about a two or three year payback period mm -hmm. instead of 18 years. So that's a, that's a great and growing business for us. So we're really just, uh, I, I feel like I have a product team in my group, and, and we're just trying out new business models as fast as we can get our CFO and risk officer to agree. So, you know, we're looking at lighting as a service, as energy yep. as a service, where maybe we'll go in and lease the ceiling and own the lights, and we're going to try out all different models. Where in the end, the objective is to bring it to the to least cost for what the customer is looking for. Absolutely. It's kind of, you know, the smart cities is kind of a buzzword right now, especially in the utility sector. Do you see this as, I mean, we're talking about street lighting and sensors. Are DERs the way that the utility sector can kind of get in on that, whether it's, you know, the light sensors or yeah. EV chargers, you know? Well, and maybe I would, on the smart cities topic, the utility has got to define itself broad, more broadly than just energy, because a lot of that's about information. And so the smart cities, if you look at the street lighting, you know, cities like San Diego and others have done things and, and put cameras with the lighting mm -hmm. or put air quality monitors or put traffic um, counters. And so if the utility thinks, how can I help enable what the city in that case wants to do, which is not just kilowatts? 
mm -hmm. um, things more broadly, then, then they could be part of the solution. Fantastic. And if you're interested in smart cities, you should check out our sister publication, Smart Cities Dive. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, after that shameless plug, uh, let's keep going back down the line. Um, Carlos, I, I, you know, I'd love to hear. So we have kind of a grab bag of different you know, business model, DER business models from NYPA, you know, as the IOU, one of the IOUs in New York and, and also in other northeastern states. Like, how, how are you guys looking at it? Yeah, so, um, so I would, first I would definitely agree with Jill. Uh, with Jill. I think answer B, it's the one that I would have voted for because I don't, I don't think necessarily the, I mean, there's always this tendency to think that utilities want to own it all. And the reality is, if it doesn't make sense for our customers, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be there, right? Um, but I want to share with both of you, I think, on that same topic, a couple of, a couple of examples on things that we're, we're working on in New York. One, it's around low-income low customers, right? So low-income customers tend to be this customer group that somewhat, somehow, always tends to get forgotten in a lot of these conferences and when people think about DERs. Those are customers that no one really thinks about that much. Um, but the reality is those customers want to want to be part of this transformation. They want to kind of benefit from the benefits of solar or storage or any of those things, like most of us, right? So um, in New York, we actually did a project in the, in the Buffalo community, a, a Buffalo community called the Fruit Belt, which is a pretty depressed community. And uh, they, we came up with the idea to say, look, those customers are having a really hard time paying their bills. Like, they basically can't afford their electric bills. And ultimately, the cost of those customers uh, not paying their bills get spread out across all customers in, in National Grid, right? It's not just those customers themselves, but everyone else has to pick up the burden. Um, so we said, what about if we put solar panels in their roofs? And we actually helped them not only to get solar in their homes, but also working with NYSERDA to actually do uh, and make upgrades to their home and do energy efficiency. And then the credits that get produced from those panels ultimately get passed back to those customers. So we actually set a target of getting 100 customers, getting 500 kW in a neighborhood that if you drive around, you wouldn't see a roof where you can actually put a solar panel. And when we signed up for that project, I'm like, this is probably one of the stupidest things that we've made. Uh, but it, we actually believe that it was one of the things that we wanted to try. And yesterday, uh, last week on, on Tuesday, we actually celebrated that we got the commitment from all customers and community to get solar panels in their home. And those customers are getting 20 to $25 uh, on their monthly bills as a result of having solar in their roofs. And, and for some of you, $25 might not mean a lot. But for those customers, actually means a lot, and in some cases, get them from a place where they cannot afford to pay their bills to a point that now they can afford to pay their bills. And then the other side of that project, which is because we own the solar panels and because we actually control how much output we can get, we can utilize new technology, smart inverters, to actually optimize how that distribution failure operates because we now ha have control of the output of those solar panels. So, it is a good way of bringing kind of some of those customers that traditionally wouldn't be part of this transformation that are also have a need of looking to how to pay their bills. And we can actually kind of bring those two things together. So that's our role where the utility can play. Um, another example in Massachusetts uh, around the solar piece, right? So in, in most developers, and I'm sure there's many of you here in the room, most people will place their solar panels just aiming down uh, due south because you want to maximize the amount of solar you produce because that, that's how most businesses, business cases are built, right? We actually have decided intentionally to put some of our solar systems aligned with the peak production in the, or the peak demand in the system. So the production of those solar systems actually matches the peak in the system and we can offset a potential upgrade to the distribution system in the future because we've been able to do those things. And we couple that with storage. So we actually have storage, we have demand response, and we have solar, all optimized by the utility with a greater good of everyone else in that system. So those are just some of the cases that when you think about the system holistically, utilities have a role to play. And we didn't do that by ourselves. We had partners in New York. We had partners in Massachusetts. Uh, so I think there's still room for everyone. We just need to get creative around what are those business models that ultimately deliver the greatest value, not just for one, customer or a subset of customers, but for the broader system. Mm -hmm. So Carlos, just is that low income solar uh, program, you know, you guys are owning and operating the panels themselves. Yeah. Is that something you would want to scale up? I would assume, you know, obviously the, the way we're talking about in New York with kind of their th thinking about utility ownership of DERs is that utilities can own, but only when the private, when they can prove that there's a private market failure, that people have been, you know, have not been served either in region or a certain segment of the market. Do you view this as 
something like that, or is yeah. this just a pilot? Yeah, um, no, so I mean, the idea, so a couple of things. So when you talk about mar market failure, we actually did a survey, and uh, I think across the US, less than 1% of low-income customers have been targeted for solar income, uh, for solar panels. And the reason it's simple. I mean, they don't have the credit score that you need to get a lease. They don't have the money to do a down payment. It's as simple as that, right? Um, so for us in upstate New York, for those of you that are familiar with it, that part of the state, it is a pretty, I mean, economically affected area. So our plan is now that we've proven the concept, really taking that to other communities within New York where that same solution will help those customers to mitigate their bills. Do you get any pushback from the DER providers? So we did. I mean, in, in all disclosure, we did get a lot of pushback early on from a lot of the distributed resources. And my counter to them was, fine, you want to be part of the project, I'm perfectly open to it. Show me how with your current structure of asking for a 750 credit score or something along those lines, you want to play in this space. And if you can come up with a better way to do it, I'm happy to entertain. And, and we actually had some pretty good productive discussions with some of them where perhaps in the future uh, they can own the panels and then the utility can backstop uh, some of the risk. Uh, or perhaps the utility have a three-way agreement where it's a utility, the partner, and the customer. Uh, so we're, we're open to continue to explore models. I think we, we, what we've demonstrated is in this model where you can optimize the solar production, where you can pass the benefits to those customers, there is a lot of benefits ultimately for those communities. Fascinating. So a challenge for any you know, providers out there, if you guys can come up with you know, more effective ways to serve low-income customers. Um, you know, Luis, I want to turn to you next. You, you talked about, uh, I believe, a uh, co-op-owned solar, distributed solar project you have. Is that correct? Um, or you know, let, let me, if I'm mistaken, let me know what you guys are doing. So, so uh, we have basically three models. Uh, we own mm -hmm. uh, some solar that we got under a clean renewable energy bond. Mm -hmm. uh, back in, in 2005 uh, to get in solar. Uh, we started uh, community solar. In fact, uh, Kit Carson has the only community solar in New Mexico, uh, mainly because right after we built it, the PRC thought it may be illegal in New Mexico to own a community solar array. So no one else has put those up. And then the, the purchase power. We have uh, several facilities that we have with a third party. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we integrate into our business model uh, which, which I think is unique and, and really hard to, to quantify from a cost is anything that the co-op does needs to enhance the quality of life of our members. And second, it, it, it's basically economic development. You know, the co-ops were formed in the 30s under the New Deal really to bring, I don't think really bring power or telephone to rural areas, but really to put people to work. They just use electricity and, and telecommunications to do that. Mm -hmm. And there, therefore we electrified. And so we haven't, we haven't gone very far from that model. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that we own, uh, those work and those are in rate base. Community solar, uh, our goal there was really to try to capture the middle and low income. And the, the, the prices were too high and we, couldn't, we just couldn't find someone to finance uh, the low income. And so uh, fully subscribed, but again, to the same, same people who uh, could afford it, they just didn't want to put it on their home. Or they had covenants in their, in their subdivision uh, or the roof was, was oriented the wrong way. So the, the latest is really, uh, we got our contract renegotiated with a power supplier. Uh, we decided that they would pick the finance company that's gonna, the developer. Uh, ours was to pick the, the group to build the, the array. So we actually got two, two uh, local contractors who were competitors, brought them the opportunity and says, if you guys can form a new company, then we'll give you the contract to build the array if 90% uh, of your employees are local to build solar. Because yeah. the other thing we thought, saw, and, and it really is a business model, if locals build it, they'll, they're, they're our best advertisers. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are really gonna produce or push out that this is a good deal. And then you have a, a, a workforce that you can export or actually maintain the arrays themselves. And so, uh, uh, so we entered into a, uh, a PPA to build these 40. Uh, the power supplier gets to pick the bank. And, and, and stepping back, co-ops are not for profit, so we don't pay income tax. And so there was, there's no tax appetite for the co-op at all. So it's better for us to find a third party. And I think the other thing we're trying to do is create partnerships. Mm -hmm. Is uh, because co-ops generally aren't that big and don't have that financial wherewithal to be financing these all, all uh, on their own. And so in, in uh, our third party, and, and our power supplier is Guzman Energy. 
So when we had to buy out, uh, we went to the conventional power public service in New Mexico, Arizona Public Service, Tucson Electric. If they have that kind of money laying around to pay off our uh, obligation, a regular would probably think they're over-earning. And so really the place to find is a bank that does power. And so our power supplier is actually an investment banking company, Guzman, a, a small boutique investment banker that had a renewable energy subsidiary. And so under that subsidiary is where we're doing all these purchase power agreements. They have found a bank actually in New York City that is then selling tax equity to the U.S. Bank. And so that's how our structure going forward as far as how we finance and operate these three, three models. We think the last is best because as I said, there's a, a big desire for, for Kit Carson or for most co-ops, most utilities, to make sure that the low and fixed income aren't left out. Whether it's uh, low income housing, uh, you know, most people in our territory, we have about 26% that live under the poverty uh, level uh, in, in our territory. And so that $25 that uh, we're talking about is a, is a big deal for them. Uh, they want to participate just like anyone else when it comes to renewable energy. Uh, they have the same issues as far as affordability, as climate change, any of the issues that are brought up. But somehow they've been disenfranchised because they, they don't have the money to, to bring to the table. So I think that's our model is if we deploy these everywhere, if we deploy them at schools, if we deploy them at low income housing, that it gives them that pride of ownership because whether the electricity goes into their house or not, they see it every single day and their assumption is they're getting it. And in most sunny days in, in New Mexico, they are getting the power. So our business model also takes into account that regardless of where you stand, if you're a coal only person, you're gonna get solar energy from Kit Carson also. Uh, and so under that business model, uh, we think the last works with the PPA because then everyone in the, in the uh, entire membership has access to renewable energy. Mm. Interesting. Well, Arlen, I feel like it's been a second since we heard from you last. <laughs> um, but I know you guys are doing some very creative things, you know, on, on the community side, behind the meter. Um, you know, can you enlighten us about the, uh, the business strategy behind that? Sure. Um, I, I, I want to kind of uh, tap back to start with something Jill said talking about. It all kind of starts with the customer. And um, I, I couldn't endorse that comment more. And so we're, we've really stepped back. And um, I think a lot of times utilities um, and, and even some third party suppliers believe that they know what a customer wants. And so we've been spending uh, a big investment, quite frankly, in applying some really complex analytics to deeply segment and finally segment our customers to really understand what each small segment values and then um, start to develop products that meet those customers' needs rather than us having a product and then rushing out and trying to find customers for that pro product. That's a complete flip in mindset from the way we used to operate, which was to develop the product and then go out and try to convince customers it's a good idea. We now go to the customers first. We even do some crowdsourcing when we have an idea. We have some online online uh, communities that we've created with our customers where we go out and test new ideas and they tell us, now nah, that sucks or that's good but it'd be better if you did this. And then we start to create products based on that. So that's kind of at the <laughs> threshold of a lot of what we're doing is applying those complex analytics around that. Um, you know, we've, we've also looked at um, the um, issue um, of wanting to ensure that all of our customers, regardless of where they are financially, have the opportunity to benefit from the promise of DERs um, going forward. And likewise, we've looked at our low income customers and we've developed some similar programs to the ones that I've heard. We, when we went out and first looked at it, um, you know, our community solar is, a, is an option. We have, we have a community solar program that's gonna go to probably a couple hundred megawatts in the next few years. Um, but it's not just one offering. Um, it is a differentiated product. There's a number of different options customers can opt for. And for low income customers, we're gonna be rolling out one that is our lowest cost solar. So we'll be buying a part of a utility scale solar field in Southern California where it's the cheapest, where we're seeing things in you know, 35, 38 cents. And that'll be this, the part of our portfolio that is allocated to those customers. They'll be able to benefit 
benefit from it, as, whereas another customer um, in a different income level maybe, maybe value a local solar field those are going to be more expensive, so they'll pay a corresponding price. You're means price. testing your solar purchases, We're, we are, basically. Because yeah. um, we do want everybody to be able to have carbon-free resources, but an undifferentiated product isn't going to meet everybody's needs from a price standpoint. So each of them will have different attributes. Um, Interestingly, we also have a rooftop solar program. We, but we've, we're doing it through a partner through a partnership. Um, one of the things that's very true is that um, for our low-income customers, we only have a small group that actually own their own homes. So um, we knew it was a more targeted program around rooftop solar. We, um, when we first we uh, partnered with Grid Alternatives to install the rooftop solar, the customer actually owns the solar on their roof. Um, but we ran into some hurdles. We identified the customers that would benefit from it, went out, and their uh, roofs are old and in bad shape. Okay, so we've got to figure out how do we do this. So next we pulled into our partnership Habitat for Humanity, so now we pay Habitat for Humanity to go in and first fix the roofs, mm -hmm. make them ready for the solar. The solar installs in at the same time. We do deep retrofits because in the past, and we deeply discount the rates for our customers, but that's like a Band-Aid on the problem. So we're really trying to focus on how do we create sustainable families and um, communities going forward, and the rest of our customers benefit because we're pulling, um, we're reducing the subsidies that ultimately the rest of our customers are, are doing. So that's kind of been our approach to both community solar and low income. Excellent. Well, 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 Dave, can I just yeah. uh, make a break from this whole DR discussion? So next time someone says that utility people are boring, I would challenge all of you to look at the socks of this distinguished panel <laughs> so you can actually see how crazy and funky. <laughs> there you go. There you, you go. Come up Sorry. With else, Julia. <laughs> just point that we're not boring I didn't check people. Out your nice socks. <laughs> there you go. See? I'm telling you. Just a break from this serious <laughs> conversation. Right here. Stop, stop. <laughs> exclamation point, exclamation point. Those were my notes. <laughs> so it's like the afternoon, so you have to keep it keep it live. And Jill, you're very fashionable. Isn't yeah, you? of course. <laughs> Well, okay, um, we only have, we've got less than 15 minutes left, or fewer than 15 minutes. Um, and I'm, there's a whole litany of operational questions that I want to get to, but I think the, the, one of the things that we have to mention before we go to audience questions is just that, you know, we've got one side of kind of the regulatory debate about DERs up here, but obviously, you know, these resources have sparked some really contentious proceedings in states around the country, whether it's, you know, in California or definitely Arizona. We saw net metering battles in New York that ended in compromise. I mean, it's kind of happening everywhere. Um, I just wonder, from, from your perspective, what do you want to see? Do you We've got a regulator panel coming up next. What, what would you like to see from state regulators and your fellow stakeholders that you think could help move the ball forward on DERs in terms of you know, increasing access to all? Like, What are the big sticking points for you guys um, that you really want people to zero in on over the next few years? Um, and whoever would like to start. Um, I know that everyone has a different like, regulatory situation here. So if you're not you know, PSC regulated, maybe you just talk about you know, what you want to see from your fellow stakeholders. Um, so maybe I'll jump in sure, first. Sure. Just um, and, I, and I will say, I, I feel like we're very fortunate because I have a board that serves as our regulator. So we have the opportunity to uh, approve rates, adopt new things very quickly. But I think um, in general in California, and I feel for my um, investor um, own brethren um, in, in California, it takes a long time to make change. And I think regulators um, tend to be reactive and even when they're trying to be proactive, they take a long time to make decisions and make approvals. The problem is technology is moving so fast, but by the time they approve something, the technology has changed so much that their approvals don't really have much meaning. So I think it's always a, so I think really regulators are gonna to have to figure out how do you reinvent themselves as regulators? And maybe one way is to focus more on outcomes and reward people who achieve those outcomes rather than, I know in California there's a lot of very specific programs that have to be mm -hmm. approved, and it seems like the staff at the CPUC spends a lot of time trying to design the programs mm -hmm. that the IOUs are gonna roll out, and to me in a more dynamic world that we're facing, that seems to be pretty contrary to. So, so maybe a vote for some more performance-based regulatory yeah, I standards? Yeah, I think that's gotta be the, in almost everything you're trying to do with climate and technology, I think 
performance-based is a much better approach. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Anyone else? So, I mean, just a couple of things. I mean, we've talked about the customer. Um, sometimes I, I feel when I'm in some of these regulatory discussions, and I always wondering if a customer shows up at this meeting, what would they say about us, mm -hmm. right? And, and I would bet in most cases, um, whether it's the utility regulators or even the market, sometimes we get fixated on what we think the right answer is, we think what the next thing is, and the reality is I think sometimes we lose sight of ultimately what, wh why we're doing all of this, which is to deliver power and benefits for customers. So I think that's an important piece. Um, I think the performance-based regulation is extremely important. Uh, concepts like uh, TOTEX, right? So moving away from this concept of CAPEX uh, and OPEX, right? Which in some cases puts a lot of constraints on how utilities and, and companies operate, right? Because they're incentivized just to operate and make money on CAPEX, right? Um, kind of getting to a more performance-based regulation, but on, not only from a, from a financial incentive perspective, but also um, one of the things that I struggle at times is when regulators try to be too prescriptive on what the solution is to the problem, it limits what the utility can do, it limits what the customers can do, and it limits the market, right? So I don't think it does anyone any favors. And part of it is because there's been bad experiences in the past, so everyone tries to narrow things as much as you can. Also, there's this point about compromising. So people end up compromising, but you end up compromising on a solution that it's not necessarily optimal for the system, but it's the one that everyone can agree on. Um, so I think trying, again, reminding everyone that it's in, that, in those discussions, is this the most optimal solution for the customers? And if the answer is no, kind of go back to the drawing board and try to do it again. Um, those are some of the things that, I mean, it goes to the utilities, it goes to regulators, but it also goes to the market. I'm, I'm, I'm not critical of the market, but I'm pretty self-spoken about the market because I've seen, I've, in my prior role, I used to deal with the market quite a bit. And I, there's many companies that basically just want to get to the utilities and try to sell them a thing without really trying to understand why that thing can help anyone else or the broader system to achieve something. Uh, so I think all of us need to kind of have that reflection moment and say, well, is this a good thing for customers or is it not? Hmm. I'll add on to that thought that we see that we're often trying to get to the right answer or the right answer that serves the most people and you can water down and end up not getting, uh, you know, as Carlos said, something optimal. But I'd love to see some updates in regulation where you allow multiple models to exist at the same time. And I think electric vehicles is a great opportunity for us to do that because it's going to come from another industry, the automotive, faster than the utility is going to be ready for it. And we know the current model, the tariffs, the demand charges, we were just talking about that before we walked on stage, we know it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what is going to work. And it's probably not the same for workplace charging as it is for throughway charging or as it is for, you know, vehicle to grid mm -hmm. or public buses. You know, so let's not spend the next 18 months fighting out what's the right vehicle charging structure and instead acknowledge that we need to try a bunch of different ones. Mm -hmm. And you know, like SMUD, we're, NIPA is fortunate that we are regulated by our own board, but we work directly with GRID and the other IOU partners. And if they can't be flexible with the tariffs, with the business arrangements they're allowed to enter into, we can't try things out. We can't do this hypothesis testing like you were talking about. So mm -hmm. we've got to allow opt opportunities to test multiple models at the same time. Interesting, interesting. Luis, do you have uh, anything Oh, no, to add? you know, most co-ops, including uh, Kit Carson, were regulated by our board. So uh, we have uh, limited regulation. So if we have enough customers that protest a rate, we can go in front of the PRC for that rate. But uh, in New Mexico, the regulators are elected uh, by, the, by the population. So for co-ops, grassroots. Mm -hmm. So if we have an issue regarding uh, DER, any of our programs, it's really just putting a lot of tremendous amount of pressure on regulators, saying this is what our members want. In essence, stay out of our business. Mm -hmm. if the members of Kit Carson want this type of program, uh, understand the impacts, the ramifications, the benefits, then, then let them leave us alone. And so we take more a grassroots approach. Mm -hmm. And we always go to our members first. Mm -hmm. as, as most here, we, when we got into the solar, we actually talked to our members, what kind, of, what kind of renewable do you want? And so it took us about a year to get the members to say, you know, solar is the one we want. So mm -hmm. when we go to regulators, when we go to elected officials, we really do have the permission of our membership to promote these type of programs. Mm -hmm. 
I think the most common qualm I probably get from uh, distributed resource providers is just that, well, darn, these utilities are just, there's just such bureaucratic inertia here. You know, that we're asking them to do things that they haven't done before. Maybe some of them are, you know, don't, don't really buy into it. But even if, you know, they have to do something, they slow walk it. We have to wait for our contracts. We have to wait to get interconnected. Um, I, I wonder, you know, what you guys are doing. And just very quickly, because I do want to ask an audience question. Um, but what are you guys doing to kind of, you know, Assuming that this exists in every large organization somewhere, right? What are you guys doing as leaders to kind of change the way people think and act around distributed resources? I'll, I'll start. I think that's a, it's a fair point. Uh, it's, it's true, right? That it's difficult to work with, with any large organization and it's not unique to utilities. Uh, but what, what we're trying to do is really bring that that customer facing experience that only usually a small subset of the employees at any company or any utility is going to have, bring that experience to as many people in the company as possible. Because if you feel and you know directly from a customer their frustration with working with us, it's, I think, a lot easier than to get the procurement department or the legal department or other people to move things in a way that can be more efficient and maybe recognize that we create some of our own bureaucracy. And so it's, it's about trying to get that customer experience to as many of our employees as possible. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, it's pretty similar for us. One, one exercise we did at our last leadership meeting, uh, which I would encourage all of you that work for large corporations to do so, um, we actually had uh, someone put a, um, like two minutes of audio together of a few calls with our call center on customers that just wanted to connect that DG system customers that had an issue with their solar panels. Simple things like that, and just hearing what the response that everyone with the best intention in the world, just because of the policies and the processes we have, how we respond to those customers. It is one of the most impactful experiences that we had within National Grid for everyone to say, look, it doesn't matter if I'm in procurement, it doesn't matter if I'm in legal, I need to find a way to help that call center rep that is on the phone and it's actually trying to answer the question. So, for us, it's been around process. So like, how do we think about end-to-end -end processes, starting with the customer and ending with the customer? Because that's the only way we can actually make it work. Mm. Good idea. Either of you guys? So I'll just jump in. And we've been doing a lot of journey mapping with every touch point for our customers mm -hmm. to try to figure out where those pain points are. The interconnection process was one of those. It was, I don't know how many handoffs we discovered. But um, by streaming it, um, we cut the, cut the time for connection quite a bit, but I think you raise a good point. I think it's more about, you know, utilities have historically had a lot of time to make decisions and we've been a monopoly. Um, that paradigm is obviously changing, so it requires an entire culture change mm -hmm. at utilities. And really, we're not just focusing on we gotta make it better from a DER standpoint, we're focused on how do we streamline our entire, how do we shift our entire culture to make decisions more quickly and streamline things so we can be more agile in everything mm -hmm. we do, whether it's our product or helping someone else bring a product or meet a customer need. Fantastic. Well. I want to get to the audience question back there. If you ask quick, they can't, they can't kick us off until we answer. Sweet, I'll make it quick. Tyler Rogers from Energy Hub. Um, everyone on the, on the panel so far has made a point of listening to the customer. I think if you take that point one step further, the, the question of customer choice comes up. So I'm curious to hear from the panel, is customer choice of DER a good thing? And if it is, how does the utility actually enable that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, customer choice, it's definitely a big thing for us. I think, um, and I was talking to someone before uh, during lunchtime, you also need to balance how much you give options to customers, because if you give them too much options, you're going to overwhelm them. Uh, one thing we're trying out, um, and it's a specific example to DR in Rhode Island, we actually partner with a company called Energy Sage, which is thinking about it as the Expedia for solar. Just basically, you want to get solar, you go there, you get quotes, you compare different options. We also are working with like Simple Energy to have a marketplace where company, customers can actually look at different options. So I think we do need to make it easier for customers. We do need to give them the options uh, to make sure that at least they can have an, make an educated decision of what they're getting, uh, especially for the residential customers and the small business customers. Some of the CNI customers are way more sophisticated because they have an energy manager that probably can make those decisions for them. But in that segment of residential, small, medium customers, you don't have that level of sophistication, so we need to make it easier for them so they can compare and contrast different options. I'll just say 
customers expect choice, and part of I view part of my job is delivering that. So I don't want to stand in the way of them. I want to help educate them to make the decision that makes be best sense for them. And as Jill said, sometimes it's not an economic decision. Sometimes it's an emotional decision. Sometimes it's the fact that they want to do something that their neighbors haven't done yet. But um, I think our job is to facilitate that and make it happen. Thank you. Well, guys. Any last words? Any last words for the regulatory panel before we're? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll I don't think you guys are. I don't think we have any of your jurisdictions up there. So, yeah, so yeah, well, actually, no. President Picker's going to be here. So oh, great! Watch. Well, he used to be on our board. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, I think going trying to tie it to the innovation panel. Um, I think uh, a question. I think again, I ask myself, and I think probably the regulators ask themselves is, what's the role of regulation with innovation? I mean, they tend to be concepts that don't necessarily match with each other. Um, but I think there are some industries that are heavily regulated where there's still room for innovation. So how, how can they continue to foster an environment that allows for innovation within certain controls? Fantastic. I think that's a great place to leave it.